Hey everybody, today we're debating whether or not Sharia law is good for humanity and we are starting right now with Muji's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Perfect Dawah. The floor is all yours. Hello, thank you very much, James, for this opportunity. <clears throat> and all right, I will start my opening statement. <clears throat> we have three types of Sharia laws. One is divine Sharia laws. Uh, uh, such as praying, fasting, not drinking alcohol, and not gambling, etc. The second Sharia law is a man-made Sharia law based on fabricated hadiths, such as um, stoning adulterers, killing apostates. The third one is wrong interpretation of Quranic verses, such as chopping hands uh, of thieves and other barbaric acts, uh, which I will talk about them later. Here are some Sharia laws that I don't think any rational person would uh, reject them. And if you don't reject them and follow them, then you uh, don't need to be worried about your salvation, according, my, um, according to my belief, because you have submitted to Allah's commands. And Allah is the most merciful and forgiving uh, and knowing that your intention was good, but you just didn't have the right information. Here are some divine Sharia laws. Quran chapter 2, verse, 100, uh, verse 83 to uh, 85. Remember when we took the a pledge from uh, the children of Israel, worship none but God. Be kind to parents, relatives, orphans, and uh, need, the needy. Speak good words uh, to all people. Keep the... Just a second, sorry. Yeah. Uh, keep up the prayer and you shall spend in charity. Then all but a few of you turned away as you were not interested. We, when we took a pledge from you, you shall not shed the blood of one another and you shall not drive one another out of your homes. You acknowledge and you bore witnesses. Yet here, uh, you are killing one another and driving a group of your own people out of their homes, supporting each other against them, them in sin and aggression. And if they come to you as uh, prisoners, you would ransom them. While their very expulsion was unlawful for you, do you then believe in some parts of the book and disbelieve in others? So what can be the punishment of those among you who do that except disgrace in this uh, in present life and on the day of judgment they shall be turned to the most severe punishment and allah is not unaware of what you do chapter 2 verse 177 righteousness is not in turning your face towards east uh, the east or the west rather the righteous are those who believe in Allah, the last day, the angels, the, book, the books, and the prophets who give charity out of their cherished wealth to relatives, orphans, the poor, needy, travelers, beggars, and for freeing slaves who establish prayer, pay alms tax, and keep the pledges they make, <clears throat> and who are patient in times of suffering, adversity, and in the heat of battle, it is they who are true in faith, and it is they who are mindful of Allah. Chapter 4, verse 75. And how could you refuse to fight in the cause of Allah and for oppressed men, women, and children who cry out, Lord, lead, lead us towards freedom out of this land of oppress oppressors. Through your grace, give us a, pr a protector and a helper. Chapter 5, verse 89. Allah will not call you to account for your thoughtless oaths, but he will hold you accountable for this deliberate uh, oaths. The penalty for a broken oath is to feed 10 poor people from what you normally feed your own family, or to clothe them, or to free a slave. But if none of this is affordable, then you must fast uh, three days. This is the penalty for breaking your oaths. Uh, so be mindful of your oaths. This is how Allah makes things clear to you. Or, so perhaps you will be uh, grateful. Chapter 107, verse 1 through 7. 
Have you seen the one who denies the religion? That is the one who uh, repulses the orphan and does not encourage the feeding of the poor. So woe to those who pray, yet are not mindful of their prayers. Those who only show up and refuse to give even the simplest aid. Chapter 16, verse 90. Indeed, Allah orders justice and good conduct and giving to relatives and forbids immorality and bad conduct and oppression. He admonishes you that uh, perhaps you will be reminded. Chapter 15, verse 85. Indeed, the hour is approaching. So pardon those who wrong you with most uh, graceful pardon without revenge. Chapter 5, verse, 80, uh, verse 8. O oh, believers, stand firm for Allah and bear true testimony. Do not let the hatred of a people lead you to injustice. Be just. That is closer to righteousness. And be mindful of Allah. Surely Allah is all aware uh, of what you do. Chapter 2, verse uh, 263. A kind word and forgiveness is better than charity followed by injury. And Allah is self-sufficient, most forgiving. Chapter 7, verse 199. Adopt forgiveness. Instruct that is right and ignore the ignorance. Chapter 4, verse 135. All believers, stand firm for justice as with, uh, witness for Allah, even if it is against yourself, your parents or close relatives, be they rich or poor, Allah is best to ensure their interest. Refrain from following your own desires so that uh, you do not act uh, unjustly. If you conceal the truth, God is fully aware of what you do. Chapter 3, verse 134. Who spend in the cause of Allah during seas and hardship, and who restrain anger, and who pardon the people. And Allah loves the doors of good. Chapter 42, verse 43. And whoever is patient and forgives, indeed, that is of the matters requiring determination. Chapter 23, verse 96. O oh, Muhammad, Repel evil in the best manner. We are well aware of all that they say about you. Okay. There are many, many more beautiful teachings of Allah that I could read. As a converted Muslim, I believe in any rational and logic teachings, and it doesn't matter if uh, the good teachings are from God or a human. Buddha says, no one in this, in this world is pure and perfect. If you avoid people for their little mistakes you will always be alone so ju judge less and love more buddha says time decides who you meet in life your heart decides who you uh, want in your life and your behavior decides who stays in your life so even though i'm a muslim i don't believe that i shouldn't follow beautiful teachings of buddha and I don't understand why any rational person should reject those beautiful commands of Allah, the most merciful and forgiving God. All right, um, now uh, I'm finished. And <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, you are muted. Thank you very much. Perfect Dawah. We're going to kick it over to David Wood for his opening statement as well. That'll be 10 minutes. If it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, I want to let you know, folks, we're, we are a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. Hit that subscribe button for many more juicy debates to come. And with that, thanks so much, David Wood. The floor is all yours. Thank you, James. I, I just glanced at the chat and I saw people are asking uh, why, you're so, uh, why you're so jacked. That's funny. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> uh, so thank you, James, uh, for hosting and for putting together these debates. And thanks to uh, Muji for challenging me to another debate and for, uh, for giving your perspective. This debate is about whether Sharia is good for humanity. It's not about whether one particular Muslim's miracle of reinterpretation is good for humanity. So I'll begin by explaining begin by explaining why actual, genuine, 100% grade A halal certified Sharia is definitely not good for humanity. And it looks like Muji 
does want to talk about some of these issues. So we'll just lay out some of the issues and then and then we can discuss them. Um, when we ask why uh, Sharia is good for humanity or whether Sharia is good for humanity, we're really asking something like, is the Taliban good for humanity? Does the world need more Taliban? Should the governments of the world model themselves after the Taliban? Uh, of course, the answer is no. But why is the Taliban bad for humanity? The Taliban is bad for humanity because the Taliban enforces what has traditionally been understood as Sharia. There are plenty of different problems with Sharia that we could discuss. Let me give a few examples and then Muji can give his understanding of these issues. And then uh, once we have that, then there's another big problem here, even if Muji is actually correct. There's a huge problem here. Uh, so some popular examples. First, under Sharia, a grown man can marry, have sex with, and divorce a prepubescent girl. This is confirmed in the Quran, the Hadith, and the uh, most respected Muslim commentaries of all time. Muhammad himself, the pattern of conduct in Islam, married a six-year-old and consummated the marriage when she so we have to ask, is marrying prepubescent girls good for humanity? Second, under Sharia, Muslim men can take female captives as their sex slaves, and they can buy, sell, and trade sex slaves. Muhammad himself, the pattern of conduct in Islam, had sex slaves. In fact, he once got caught having sex with one of his slave girls in his wife Hafsa's bed while she was out running some errands. And so we have to ask, is sex slavery good for humanity? Is human trafficking good for humanity? Third, under Sharia, Muslim men can beat their wives into submission simply for fearing some sort of disobedience or rebellion from the wife. We learn from Muhammad in the Hadith that men are allowed to beat their wives until their skin turns green. Muhammad said that no one should ask a man about why he beat his wife because it's no one's business. So is domestic violence good for humanity. Fourth, under Sharia, the penalty for stealing is chopping off the hand of the thief, but losing a hand makes it even more difficult for the thief to make an honest living. So is dismemberment good for humanity? Fifth, under Sharia, the penalty for adultery is death by public stoning. Are public executions by stoning good for humanity? Is that something that we should uh, be implementing to improve the world? Sixth, under Sharia, anyone who leaves Islam and refuses to return to it is to be executed. Even popular Muslim YouTubers like Ali Dawa openly call for the public executions of apostates who spread their apostasy. So is publicly executing people for rejecting the most obvious false prophet in history good for humanity. Seventh, under Sharia, jizya is to be imposed on Christians and Jews who refuse to convert to Islam. Christians and Jews who don't want to convert to Islam and who don't want to be brutally murdered for their faith are required to pay money to Muslims as a way of publicly acknowledging the superiority of Muslims. So is it good for a religion to act like the mafia? Now, we see Sharia being implemented to various degrees in Muslim countries around the world. Many Muslim countries implement a watered-down version of Sharia, where the most brutal penalties are no longer enforced. But we start to see Sharia in all its uh, blood-spattered gory, gore, goriness, beheadings, um, amputations, groups like the Taliban or ISIS rise to power. We all, we all seem to understand that it's bad for humanity. Even most Muslims, when they see Sharia being implemented, want no part of it. So why are we having this debate? Why are, why are we having a debate about whether Sharia is good for humanity if Sharia is obviously bad for humanity? How is this even a topic for debate? Well, we're debating whether Sharia is good for humanity because there are Muslims who believe in Allah and Muhammad and the Quran, but who understand that Sharia, as it's been understood for nearly 14 centuries, 
is terrible for humanity. So they reinterpret the commands of Allah and Muhammad. But reinterpreting the commands of Allah and Muhammad So the, the three main options for Muslims here are, one, you can believe in Islam and you can accept what it teaches about Sharia. You can believe in Islam and accept what it teaches about the laws that are to be imposed. This is the approach that the Taliban takes. Two, you can believe in Islam and then reinterpret what it teaches about Sharia. This is uh, Muji's approach. And three, you can stop believing in Islam. You can say, hey, I don't believe that this is from God, so I'm not going to reinterpret it. I'm just going to abandon this religion. So Muji's approach is actually fairly common nowadays, uh, especially in the West. And the modern Western approach to interpreting Islam's most trusted text is to go through Islam's most trusted sources, find everything that you agree with, and claim that when Allah and Muhammad said those things, they really meant what they said. They really meant what they said when they say the things that I, I agree with. And then once you figured out that, wow, Allah agrees with everything I already believe in because I've gone through and I've picked out all the passages that agree with me. Once you've done that, then you can go through and you can find all the verses that you don't like where Allah says that you don't like and don't agree things because I've already had all these, I've already shown all these passage, passages over here where Allah agrees with what I believe. So since Allah just keeps agreeing with me, he must not mean what he says in these other passages a reason to dismiss or reject them. Uh, with the hadith, it's very easy. You just say, that's a weak hadith. That's a weak hadith. Even if it's in Islam's most trusted sources, even if it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and so on, even if it's there multiple times, even if it's all over the collections of hadiths, uh, no problem. It was all just it was all just made up. Um, so you could do that there. And then with the Quran, it usually goes like this. Ah, here's the word, and here's how Muslims have understood it for 14 centuries. But, but... This word, actually, if you look at the root, can mean this other thing. So Allah is actually saying something very different from what it has sounded like he's saying to scholars for 14 centuries. He really means something else. And this brings us to two possibilities. And this is why I'll say that even if we grant everything about Sharia. In other words, if I sit here and I say, you know what, who cares what 14 centuries of Muslims and Muslim scholars and Muslim governments and Muslim leaders and the caliphs and um, the greatest Muslim scholars of all time, who cares what they all say? We are sitting in the presence of greatness and Muji is the only one in history who's ever under actually understood Sharia. He's got it. Suppose we conclude that he is saying is pretty good, so therefore, Sharia is good for humanity. No. Obviously, then you'd be saying that Sharia is so unclear that Allah's commands, what Allah has commanded is so hopelessly unclear that in 14 centuries, it's been understood by one person. Who wants a legal system that can't be understood by the incredibly vast majority of people who ever try to understand it. No one wants a legal system that no one can understand. So, two options here, ladies and gentlemen. Either Allah meant what he said, and it's brutal, and it's bad for humanity, or Allah meant something completely different, but it sounds like he meant something that's horrible for humanity, and either way, that's bad for humanity. You got it. Thank you very much for that opening statement, David. And we're going to go into rebuttals, folks. want to let you know, as I mentioned earlier, welcome to everybody, no matter what walk of life you are from. And with that, the seven minute rebuttals begin. Thanks so much, Perfect Dawah. The floor is all yours for that first rebuttal. Oh, I think that you might be on mute in Zoom. Let me just double check. Yeah, all right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to say that, uh, of course, uh, David uh, brought up a lot of different uh, you know, things that uh, 
for sure we don't wish to talk about all of them one by one. But anyway, <clears throat> if uh, David says that um, all Muslims um, believe in that, first of all, it is not like that. I'm not the only one. Uh, I've said it many times before. There are other people and um, uh, my organization that I'm following also, they um, interpret the Quran. That, uh, this, uh, this, of course, the in there they are uh, themselves um, uh, a bunch of uh, businessmen and they they want power so they don't care about uh, the correct interpretation of uh, you know Quran and um, even Iranian uh, government who chop hands they are a bunch of mafia and thieve themselves and they chop people's hands so uh, I have to uh, read uh, this uh, verse once again of course we talked about uh, such things before as well and I have to say uh, one more thing is that why now we are uh, you know uh, reinterpreting uh, Quran is because in the past if I was living two three hundred years ago most probably I couldn't read and write so definitely I would just follow imams and scholars blindly but today we have education we have uh, you know internet we uh, we can communicate with each other we have uh, i meet different people from different parts of the world uh, doctors and people who uh, start themselves they have time and education to reinterpret quran and uh, you know read them so chapter 3 verse 7 once again i have to uh, say this to david is that it is he who has sent down to you oh muhammad the book in it, in it are Verses that are precise, they are the foundation of the book and specific. Uh, as for those whose heart uh, hearts is corrupted, they will follow that of it which is unspecific. So those whose heart is corrupted, okay, unfortunately, uh, David Wood uh, goes with them, those Taliban and, uh, you know, Iranian fascist regime, who they just want to make money through religion, those whose heart is uh, corrupted, they go after those unspecific verses of Quran, like chopping hats, okay? Um, they will follow that which is unspecific, desiring to create confusion and their own interpretation. So they, they have a different interpretation. And no one knows its true interpretation except Allah and those firm in knowledge. And they say, we believe in it, all it is from our Lord. And no one will be reminded except those of understanding. So last time I uh, brought up this one again so that um, I will bring it up again. Uh, if uh, David would uh, go with me, um, let me chopping hands, okay? So David, uh, you have to know that um, in uh, chapter 5, verse 30, 38, that they say that uh, thieves' hands has to be chopped off, uh, is, it used uh, the, the words that and yad, okay? And the same word is using in chapter 12, verse 31, okay? And last time we read it together and you saw that the same verb, the same words has been differently translated in both uh, uh, these two chapters. Chapter 5, verse 38, they translate it as chopping hands. And in chapter 12, verse 31, they translate it as cutting hands. So every rational person understands that cutting hands is different with both hands of thieves in chapter 12 verse 31, obviously those women who were uh, peeling, if you want, uh, I can read for you chapter 12 verse 31. <clears throat> when she heard about their gossip, she invited them and set a banquet uh, for, for them. <clears throat> she gave each one said to Joseph, come out before them. When they saw him, they were so stunned by his beauty that their hands and uh, exclamate, uh, ex uh, sorry, exclamate, God, uh, good God, this cannot be human. This must be a noble angel. Okay. So first of all, why here is cut hands and there is chop hands? Because here rationality comes in and says that, no, it cannot be possible that when you are 
peeling a fruit, you chop your both hands. Even you maximum is that you cut your hand. Okay, which even doesn't make sense that they cut their hands and they were women. They didn't scream. Quran doesn't talk about a single blood of uh, you know. And then how can be possible? Chapter five, verse thirty-eight says that. Chop their hands, and then next verse 39 says that, and if they uh, repent, Allah will forgive them. So, uh, I gave this example also that last time that <clears throat> how can, uh, uh, if you pass the red light, the officer catch you and take your driving license and write you a thousand dollars ticket, and you say, Oh, officer, forgive me. The officer, officer tells you that, Okay, I forgive you, but you have to pay the thousand dollars ticket, and I take your driving license. That doesn't stop forgiving, okay? So the forgiving is that giving his, him back the <clears throat> driving license and uh, taking back the ticket and say, okay, next time don't do that, okay? So how can you chop someone's hands? Who? How can I repent? If, so because you have already, and I will play a little bit for the, um, uh, a shay that I had a discussion with. They say that we punish people here so that they are not going to be punished next slide. So um, I think uh, I don't have more time. So I will play that video later. Okay. And there are, there were many other things that you were talking. So we later we talk about sex slaves, beating wives, all these these things. Okay. Please. You got it. We're going to jump into the. Next you are slide. muted. <laughs> Thanks for that reminder. We're going to jump into the next rebuttal. And folks, I know that the interconnection, internet connection is a bit weak. So once in a while, you have a dropped word or two. And pardon me for that as I'm streaming while traveling. But we are going to jump into the seven-minute rebuttal from David Wood. Thanks, David. The floor is all yours. David muted. Check, check. All right, okay. ready for you and starting the timer right now. All right, well, thank you, Muji. And in my opening statement, I showed that Sharia, as it's been understood for nearly 14 centuries, is obviously and indisputably bad for the world. It seems like Muji actually agrees with me. It seems like Muji agrees that Sharia, as it's been understood for nearly 14 centuries, um, by the vast majority of Muslim scholars and Muslim rulers and so on, is obviously and indisputably bad for the world. But Muji thinks that he understands what Sharia really is and that it's this very different from what we think of as Sharia. Uh, 14 centuries of Muslim scholars got it wrong, but Muji got it right. He quotes Surah 3, verse 7 of the Quran, uh, which says that some verses of the Quran are unclear. Uh, let, let me let me read what the Quran says on the issue of clarity of the Quran here. Surah 11, verse 1. <clears throat> this is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection, and then they have been expounded in detail. 12.1. These are verses of the clear book. 15.1. These are the verses of the book and of a Quran that makes things clear. 24.46. Certainly we have revealed clear communications. 26.2. These are the verses of the book that makes things clear. 27.1. These are verses of the Quran, a book that makes things clear. 28.2. These are verses of the book that makes things clear. 57.9. He it is who sends down <clears throat> clear communications upon his servant that he may bring you forth from utter darkness into light. So it sounds over and over again in the Quran, like, I mean, like a beating drum, that Allah really, really means exactly what he says. And then we get to Surah 3, verse 7, where he says, where Allah says that, you know, hey, some of these verses uh, only Allah really understands. And so what do you do? How do you reconcile those as a Muslim? Well, the, the traditional method of reconciling those passages is that, some of the theological verses of the Quran can't really be understood by humans. Only Allah is really going to understand saying human beings can't get their mind around uh, things of the unseen very well. So, but when Allah gives you a command, he makes his command crystal clear. That's the traditional way of reconciling all these Quran verses that say the Quran is crystal clear with 
the, this other verse that says that there are unclear verses. The theological claims can't really be understood by human beings. They're too far beyond us. But when Allah gives you a command, something to obey, he's crystal, crystal clear. Muji, it sounds like, completely reverses that, where when Allah's giving you commands on penalties to enforce and so on, when he's given commands, then these are the unclear verses. And then people just use those unclear verses to, um, to you know, uh, help out their own agendas here. And so he, he once again completely reverses what traditional Islam has taught. And so we we can kind of go down the line. It looks like he only really uh, responded to one of the points I brought up, but we've got a discussion period. So marrying prepubescent girls, the Quran has really sounded like it was saying that it's okay to marry, have sex with, and divorce prepubescent girls. Taking sex slave, that's been taken for granted. That was taken for granted during the time of Muhammad. Beating women into submission. If you simply fear rebellion from your wife, you can beat her into submission. Uh, chopping hands off. And here, uh, Muji says that this ref chopping the hands off. Uh, he says the Quran, you know, talks about repentance there and forgiveness. And so how can, he said, how can I repent if my hand's been chopped off? But uh, I think it's pretty clear. You repent, Repenting is, you're, you're, you're changing your mind and and ceasing with some sin that you've been committing. You can do that. You can stop committing some chopped off. That that's the in fact that's the idea. The other issue is we see exactly how this works in the Muslim sources. So Sahih Muslim 4187, uh, it's a long hadith so I don't want to read all of it, but um there were people who were thinking that that Muhammad could simply intercede or some wealthy person or some important person could intercede for someone who's going to have his hand chopped off or her hand chopped off and just say, hey, well, we're not going to enforce that punishment because, you know, some, some important person is interceding. And Muhammad responded, daughter of Muhammad were to steal, I would have her hand cut off. So Muhammad's saying, look, my own daughter got caught stealing, I would chop her hand off. So this is Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, who is considered the greatest interpreter of the Quran. He's interpreting Allah's commands as, yeah, I should, I, I would chop the hand off my own daughter, have her hand cut off. And we actually see Muhammad carrying, carrying out this penalty in the, in the very next city, Sahih Muslim 41, 88, uh, after he says this, so by him in whose hand is my life, even if Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, were to commit th commit theft, and this is a response to Muji here, even if daughter were to commit theft, I would have her hand cut off. He, the Holy Prophet, then commanded about that woman who had commit who had committed theft, and her hand was cut off. So not Fatima, a woman who the issue raised this issue for the Muslim community. She stole something and Muhammad had her hand cut off. And Aisha further said, hers was a good repentance. And she later on married and used to come to me after that. And I conveyed her needs and problems to Allah's messenger. So the woman stole something. Her hand was chopped off. She repented. And then it says she had a good life after that. She got married. She didn't need to steal anymore. And she lived happily ever after with one hand. And so this is once again the problem that I'm talking about, because we can, you know, we can obviously go on and talk about the stoning for adultery, killing apostates, paying jizya. We have all these issues and the claim is that we need to reinterpret these things, but there are only two possibilities. Either they mean what they say, Allah's commands mean what they say, and it refers to these horrible penalties, or they mean what Muji says, in which case they're so horribly unclear that 14 centuries of Muslims all got it wrong. Either way, not good for humanity. Thank you very much, David. And thanks folks in chat for letting us know that a word or two occasionally drops and I'm working on that connection issue. So thanks so much. We definitely have gotten that feedback and we're gonna jump into open dialogue. So this will be about 60 minutes. The floor is all yours. Perfect Dawa and David Wood. Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, I said from the beginning, there are a lot of uh, things that uh, has been mentioned here, and I don't think we wish to talk about all of them. And uh, you keep 
continue to say that I'm the only one who uh, reinterpreted Quran. And I said that, no, I'm not the only one. There are millions of people who uh, understand it differently. And I said as well, uh, in the past, people would just uh, follow uh, a bunch of uh, uh, scholars who um, their job was to sell God. And it is not only Islam, of course, it's in um, all other religions as well. Okay. And uh, I can, um, I want to share one, um, you know, uh, let me see, share screen uh, or how can I share file? Yeah. If you'd like to share screen on the bottom of the- Yes, that is, uh, I want to share file. Uh, right, you do that by sharing screen. So if you, right, okay. if you go to the bottom, right. as long as it's open, Namely, oh, the file okay. you want to show. You can select which window or which file you want to show. Uh, let me see one second. Okay. Sure. In the meantime, folks, okay, our now, guests are yeah, linked in the description. So Highly encourage you if you'd like to check out both Perfect Dawas and David's link. As mentioned, that's in the description box below. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, I've got to adjust the size, right. but let me just adjust the size. Yes. In the meantime, folks, as mentioned, both of our guests are linked in the description, and now they can see it full screen. All right. Uh, David, you see here that uh, somebody's talking, uh, this is uh, Sunnah al Dawood or something, yeah. somebody's talking to, uh, I think, a Jew, okay? Uh, somehow, this person wants to say that Quran and uh, Torah, I think, uh, yes, are the same, uh, from the same uh, origin or something. And he says that, uh, look, uh, the the stony verse in Torah and, you know, Quran is the same, yeah? Then, young, um, I believe in these and who revealed these. He then said, bring to me learning amount, transmitted, said, uh, let me see, you uh, uh, is talking about the stone uh, verse of uh, Torah. Do, do you read it? Uh, yes, I know this hadith very well because it's one of the it's one of the hadiths where Muhammad affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah. So yeah. he, he oh, has the, he has the Jews bring the Torah yeah. of their time. We know yes. what the Torah of that time said, and Muhammad okay. said, "I believe in you and in the one who revealed you." So he affirms yes. the actual okay. Torah. So it, yes. we use we use this to refute people who say the the the, the Bible's been corrupted and so on. Okay, so, all right. Th th that's the thing is that these people have tried so hard. First of all, when I talk to these extremists uh, and say that uh, hadith, these hadiths like stoning adulterers is fabricated, they refer, say right away, look, it is in Torah and Bible, okay? And I tell them that, how come you believe that Torah and Bible have been corrupted, okay? And then only when you want to prove me that this verse that is uh, missing in Quran, this barbaric act of stoning a human being is missing in Quran, and you cannot find it, and you try to persuade people that it was eaten by a goat, and then Everywhere in different hadiths, you try to, you know, and here also they try to prove it through Bible and Torah, okay? Which, of course, I say that these verses, these commands were never a command of the most loving God that I, a sinner, stone another human being to death, okay? So these are practice of the barbaric uh, uh, pagans and Quran confirm it in many verses of Quran that if you do this, they stone you. So stoning in Quran is a, an act of pagans, okay? So uh, that's Muji, why- Muji, 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 yes. uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna correct anything you say. I'm just, the issues we're talking about right here. So I'm just gonna clarify what you're yes. saying because you brought up like the, uh, uh, the hadith, the goat eating them and so on so yes, i'm yes. just gonna i'm just gonna for people who are new to all of this and don't know what we're don't know what we're talking about here uh so here's the issue ladies and gentlemen that, that muji is pointing out um it is it has been considered by uh by by muslims for for centuries that uh the penalty for adultery is death by stoning we go to the hadith and according to the hadith the verse was revealed as part of the quran but you can open the quran today and it's not in the quran so the question is what happened to 
verse in the Quran, if it was revealed and if it's supposed to apply, where is it? And so you go to the Hadith and they talk about the verse being revealed, um, but then Aisha had the only copy of the Quran verse. And so a goat came in, a goat or a sheep in Sunan Ibn Majah, um, came and ate that passage, ate that passage of the Quran. And she had the only copy, so they didn't have a copy with that verse anymore. And so it's no longer in there. But if you, um, if you look at what Muslim scholars say today because a muslim obviously doesn't want to believe that the you know parts of the quran were lost because a sheep or a goat ate them um so muslims will say that uh that it was abrogated that the verse was abrogated from the quran <clears throat> but notice they want to say that the verse has been abrogated from the quran but they still want to apply the ruling they still want to say it's they different categories of abrogation where sometimes Allah, but he leaves it in the Quran, even though it's been abrogated. And other times Allah removes a verse, abrogates a verse and the ruling. So he takes it out of the Quran because it no longer applies. But then in this case, it's one where he, it's the verse, removes it from the Quran, even though it's still supposed to apply to Muslims and Muslims are still still supposed to uh, apply this verse. So that's how Muslims are reconciling their belief in perfect preservation of the Quran with the fact that this verse is supposed to apply and is no longer in the Quran. And I think Muji and I would agree on this, that there's something, there's something suspicious about that entire method of interpretation where you're saying Allah removed a verse that he still wants to apply, but he removed the verse from the Quran. And then if you were to go to the sources and say, why was this verse removed? The only explanation is Aisha's sheep ate it or Aisha's goat ate the verse. So we're looking at that and going, hey, this is suspicious. And from my perspective, I'm looking at that going, Man, I, I just I just don't trust this whole idea of perfect preservation, all this all these other things. And Muji is interpreting it as the verse was just never there. They just made that up later. They made that they made up the story because they wanted to enforce the penalty of stoning, but it wasn't in the Quran. According to Muji, it was never in the Quran. And so they, 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 these, they made uh, up they made up the hadith. Yeah, so yes. they made up the hadith in order to pretend like it was there so they could still enforce it. So that, okay. I just wanted, just wanted to clarify that for Yeah, thank you. Now Muji, I, I want to give you a chance to screen you. share. Chapter 11, verse Muji, Muji, I want to give you a chance to screen share if you wanted. I, I was just stopping the screen share before just because I usually yeah, wait I until the person can explain it to be able to put it on the screen. I realize. Uh, after I read these uh, verses, screen, okay? Uh, that's the uh, sheikh that I had a uh, debate with, okay? Uh, a, a little debate. Okay, chapter 11, verse 91. It's to Suhaib, uh, Shuhaib. Uh, and they said, Oh, Shuhaib, we do not understand much of what you say, and most surely we see you to be weak among us. And were it not for your family, we would surely stone you, and you are not mighty against us. Chapter 18, verse 20 is about Ash Ashan. Um, for sure, uh, for surely, if they prevail against you, they would stone you to death or force you back to their religion, and then you will never succeed. So there are many verses in Quran that's talking about stoning by pagans. So it was a ritual by pagans, and unfortunately, they uh, inserted these verses in uh, Bible and Torah, and they wanted to do it in Quran. That's why I believe that Quran was protected. So they tried to do it, but they couldn't because it was memorized by many people. That's why they came with fabricated hadiths. Now I would like to share this. Uh, you know, I had a uh, debate with this uh, Sheikh uh, Haitam. Is uh, I don't know if you know him. He's quite also famous. Okay, so uh, let me share and see what he talked about uh, this stoning. The audio is super low. I don't think anybody's going to be able to hear it. Okay, it's low. Uh, let me see. You could always just say what the scholar says. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You, All right. Okay. All you right. Can share, you can share the clip later uh, on, on your site and so on. But yeah, you could just tell us what. what yes, he, he says that. He says that uh, these people, they first of all, they are not accused for adultery. Okay. They confess themselves because they want to be 
uh, you can then in that case you can remove it uh, uh, you, you don't need to keep it now stop the sharing let me see uh, stop sharing okay yes he says that uh, we stone them so that they are uh, clear we uh, because these people they believe very much that they have done something wrong and to be stoned to death okay i think we missed so, uh, part of my interruption i think sorry well the connection is normally not like this i think we missed like the last sentence that you just said muji normally it's only one word that drops but in that case i think we missed like, all right okay so i said that this sheikh said that uh, they stone people to death because these people they believe that they have done something committed something wrong and they want to be pure so they come and ask this sheikh and these extremist people to stone them to death so that they go to uh, heaven and this uh, sheikh was uh, once saying that um, the, the, and then uh, after this there was an imam also i was talking uh, imam from houston mosque that he said that i do not believe that these because Allah cannot put me in, uh, you know, question in the day of judgment that you should follow a verse that you cannot see in, in, in Quran. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, this is uh, what I was going to say about that. These uh, people, they just um, uh, say uh, they try to impose this uh, barbaric act uh, by fabricated hadiths, and they even try to uh, prove it by uh, Torah and Bible, despite they believe that uh, they were corrupted. And uh, so what, what, what we agree on there is that the explanation given by many Muslim scholars when they're trying to put all of this stuff together with it being revealed in the Quran and then coming up missing from the Quran and then uh, the only explanation in the Muslim sources is that the, the sheep or goat ate the verses and that's why it's not in the Quran. But Muslim scholars who don't want to say that, you know, parts of the Quran were lost by, by a goat, uh, that, that Allah was, you know, allowing things to be taken. Actually abrogated, which is weird because according to the Hadith, like Umar wanted to add it back in. <laughs> Umar wanted to add the, add the, um, the verse back into the Quran. So they're looking at all of this and they say, well, there's this extra category of abrogation where Allah removes the verse, but the verse still applies. So the, the verse is supposedly in Allah's eternal Quran. Allah reveals it uh, in the Quran that we have in the world, and then it disappears because he abrogated the verse, even though he wants the ruling to still apply. I think we agree that that is a very, very um, so we agree, we agree on that sort of thing, but notice with, with me, I can grant, and I, I said this, I said this earlier, I can grant everything you're saying about you have the correct interpretation. This was just made up by later Muslims that this was made up because they wanted to later and then they start coming up with these silly explanations for why this verse is supposedly in the Quran but is is somehow missing and we could say they made up stories about Umar wanting to insert the verse back into the Quran we could say they they made all of this up because these sources come from you know if you're talking about Bukhari this comes from two centuries uh after it was written uh soon in Abu Dawud a, a little later than that so there was plenty of time to invent things like that I think we're on the same page there but really my my uh, my view in all of this is a uh, opening statement that assuming you're right assuming you're right and you have the correct interpretation uh Sharia would still be bad because look at what you have to do Look at what we have to do in order to get what Sharia actually is. We have to go to sources that are hopelessly unclear. We have to go to sources that are filled with things that people made up later. We have to go um, to the Quran, which has been interpreted for 14 centuries by people who, according to you, are just interpretation of the Quran. And we have to somehow sift through all of that mess to try and figure out um, how we're supposed to live right now. And the, the overwhelming tide of interpreters for 14 centuries have given us something that we agree would actually be very bad 
for the world today. And the people who are interpret who are reinterpreting these things are always going to be in the minority. Um, I'm not talking about there are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of Muslims. I'm talking about once you get to the the scholarly level of people who are interpreting the Quran. Um, they usually get eaten alive if they're talking to you know, on. Um, and so the, you would have, let, let's just see how this would play out. Suppose a bunch of people agreed with you and suppose I agreed with you and suppose James agrees with you and suppose all the viewers right now agree with you that you have the correct interpretation of Sharia. So suppose we were to stand up and say, great, Sharia is actually good for the world. We want this version of Sharia. Well, there are the world is filled with Muslim sheikhs and imams who are going to look at that and say, you're saying what about Sahih al-Bukhari? You're saying what about Sahih Muslim? You're saying what about uh, our sources on the things that Muhammad said? You're saying that that verse isn't clear and that Allah is not clear in his commands and that we have to reinterpret what Muslims have said and it just wouldn't work out that way. So the point, once again, is Either way, this is a bad legal system. Either Allah means what 14 centuries of Muslims have said for humanity, or Allah means what you say, but it's so unclear that 14 centuries of Muslims have misunderstood it. Either way, we do not want that. Uh, we do not want that. It's, it's, it's not good for the world. It's bad, or it's so hopelessly unclear that it's really, really bad. So either way, it's bad. And if it's bad, it's it's obviously not good. And I think we have our answer on the uh, topic of the debate here. But uh, uh, I read for you those verses. And uh, as I said, I don't think any rational person would reject those beautiful teachings of Allah. And uh, what I believe is that what I understand uh, uh, of creation is that Allah wanted also to test us. He wanted that we grow we develop slowly, slowly, and he, he wasn't, you know, in a hurry. He waited billions of years. For example, the, the verse uh, in Torah about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, uh, several or, or 1,500 or 2,000 years later, uh, in Quran, Allah put a, a, a sentence on that and said that despite you have the right to, you know, uh, uh, to revenge or to to punish someone if someone take your eye or tooth is better for you. Allah will forgive uh, your sins. So um, for me, if Allah didn't want us to do such a things, for example, take each other's eye, the time was not you know, good for people to understand uh, the the beauty the beauty. Of uh, God's message, okay, if you like, I say God, not Allah, because you don't believe in Allah, but anyway, God's message. So he sent his messages slowly, slowly, uh, you know, uh, after a few hundred years or a thousand years, a new prophet and so on. So this is, um, <clears throat> uh, but he waited, he knew that one day we will understand and one day we, we start, people educate themselves and we start to open these, uh, <clears throat> you know, verses of Quran and uh, understand it uh, in a better way because, <clears throat> as I said, any rational person would not uh, would understand that you cannot forgive someone that has been already punished so severe. Okay, that uh, um, uh, you know both hand has been chopped off. When Allah in the next verse says that, and if they repent, Allah will forgive them. And then next verse says that, did you know that? the uh, entire universe belong to Allah. He can forgive or punish whomever he wants. So according to my understand, <clears throat> understanding is that <clears throat> we are not the one who can punish people or you know judge people. Let me uh, read. Uh, it is not only me. Uh, I, will, I will read for you once again. Ali, Ali radiallahu was writing to his uh, governor of Egypt says that Malik, <clears throat> the worst people for you must be those who try to reveal people's mistake and sins because people make mistakes and sins and the governor is the one who must cover them do not try to find people's mistake because your duty is to fix the problems that leads people to bad deeds <clears throat> and it is god's right to judge people not yours 
cover people's mistake and sins as much as you can so that God covers yours. <clears throat> so it is not only me, it is uh, it has been 1400 years ago also. Ali radiallahu says, not the one who judge people. You are not God. God is going to judge people. You are not going to punish people. Fix the problem, okay? So uh, about, um, uh, you know, wife beating, be, uh, I think last time I was uh, telling you as well, I don't know if you uh, want but, but, uh, so, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine going on a new topic, uh, Muji. Just let me let me get my thoughts yes. very quickly on what you just said, and then we then we can move on to to uh, to this issue. Um, I just want to respond to the idea. But first of all, we we do agree on the idea. God can, I would agree that God can reveal something that that people aren't going to be able to fully process or grasp, and that it's going to take. Because uh, a lot of people don't understand how messed up uh, a lot of ancient cultures were. And you just come in, and if you were to just give something completely, just radically different that they would never in a million years understand, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not going to go very far. Totally, I would be totally fine with Allah in Islam injecting some ideas into society that people might not grasp at first, but then over time they would grasp. The question is whether whether that's actually... Um, the case here, but I, the, the only thing I uh, the only thing I really disagree with here is this idea that if uh, if someone is punished, then you you can't forgive them. It's not forgiveness if someone's been punished, and th that's that's just not true, right? If you if you like rob me, let's say, let's suppose I'm walking outside and and Muji robs me and so on, and then you end up going to court and they sentence you to ten years for robbery. Um, I, I can still forgive you or not forgive you. I can still say, you know what, you know, I, I just hate this guy forever. He robbed me. It's it's totally horrible. Even though he's being punished for it, I still just I still hate him. Um, or I could say, you know what, and he's been punished. Why am I still going to hold this against him forever? You know what, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and uh, and forgive him. And and again, in, in the in the hadith I quoted. The entire issue was brought up before Muhammad. Can we just let this woman slide with with some intercession? Someone, can we please not chop her hand off? And that's when chopped off. Muhammad orders uh, orders them to chop her hand off. They chop her hand off, and then it says, "But then you know she had a great repentance, M meaning she she just turned away from her life of theft and so on, got married, and uh, lived happily ever after with." with a, a missing hand. So uh, just so you know, I, I'm totally fine with you saying that that, stuff, that that stuff didn't happen. Just agreeing on that little point that you can't forgive someone if, if they've been punished. Of course you can, I would say you can definitely forgive people if they've been no, punished. But if you want to go on to the issue of, uh, no, of, of no, wife beating, that, no, that's fine. No, no. Uh, uh, David, I, I don't think that you made a wrong uh, it's uh, you put two different parties here the government and yourself okay the government cannot say okay now you repent i uh, we forgive you 10 years he has been there if you release that person after nine years okay you forgave him one year okay so you can say that i for we forgive you one year but after you, uh, 10 years and then i told you that why in that chapter, uh, the other chapter is uh, the same sentence, the same words are cutting hand and this one is chopping hands. What makes them think that uh, here you have to say chopping hands and there you have to say cutting hands? Because there in the, the chapter 12, verse 93, I think it was, uh, it doesn't make sense that, uh, that those women were peeling the, the same verb the same words, and then this hand has been 120 times used in Quran. Uh, word cut, which is cut, has been also 32 times used in Quran, many different meanings. So those who's, uh, who don't understand, didn't understand, they thought that, okay, yes, a, a thief's hand should be chopped off. Okay, so that's why they uh, interpret it or translate it in this way. It is not translation. You have to interpret the, these words that you cannot, you know, people have the right to, uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I will read for you, uh, let me see, chopping hands. Allah says in chapter 16, verse 61, 
if Allah were to punish people immediately for their wrongdoing, he would not have left a single living being on earth, but he delays them for an appointed term. And when their term arrives, then they cannot delay it for a moment, <clears throat> nor can they ad advance it. So uh, if Allah was going to punish people, then he, he would do it himself. He wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, wait that I punish people. Okay. So he says that I give them time. How come Prophet Muhammad, he forgave Abu Sufyan who killed hundreds of Muslims. He didn't put him a single day in jail. His wife, Abu Sufyan's wife, killed Prophet's uncle, Hamza. She didn't go to jail a single day. And then you uh, chop someone's hands for stealing something. That's not true. Um, Prophet Muhammad was the most merciful and forgiving prophet of God. And he said that the pleasure you get in forgiveness, you never get it in revenge. Okay. And I read many verses of Quran that Quran says, forgive, forgive. Oh, Muhammad, forgive. You know, and uh, if I, if you want, I can read other verses of Quran that uh, how Allah command Prophet Muhammad to, to act against evil things. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Let me uh, just respond very quickly. Um, on the issue of the the government forgiving someone, well, they they're not forgiving someone uh, if the if they punish people. Um, even that even that's wrong. Uh, you the the way people have conceived this is if you commit some crime, you do something wrong. There's some sort of it's like there's an imbalance in the world. There's an, there's an imbalance of uh, justice has been wrong and now there's some sort of imbalance. There's something that has to be fixed. And so the, the concept in Islam is like something is, something is out of whack, both with, with God and with the world and with you know, your, your fellow human beings and that that somehow needs to get put right. And the traditional Muslim view is that once you've been punished, all right, it's been fixed. The, the scales have been fixed. You, you, you stole something. Now something is, is out of balance, out of balance. There is, there is injustice in the world. Well, now your hand has been chopped off. Okay, that's the method that Allah gave for human beings to then set that right. So now things are in balance again. Now, now we, for, we forgive you. Things have been made right through the penalty that Allah has given. Um, as for as for the rest of these things, um, Muhammad just forgiving everyone, uh, forgiving the people. Who I, I still don't know how you're how you're reading sources because yet yeah, the you, you can go to you can go to a source and say, well, Muhammad forgave this person. So in other words, he they they come to Mecca. Muhammad says that all right, everyone everyone has to uh, everyone has to convert now um, or or start running. And then, oh, your people are converting. His old enemies are converting. Uh, to, to me, it looks like that was always Muhammad's goal from the beginning was to get his tribe to submit to him as leader. Once they did that, uh, I think he was good. But the, the, the same sources would say that Muhammad gave a list of people who had insulted him at various times and say that those people... Um, those people have to be executed, even if they're even if they run to the Kaaba, even if they run to the Kaaba for to seek refuge. Those people still have to be killed. So it looks like we have the same method over and over and over again, which is go through the source, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the Hadith or commentaries or whatever. Go to the source. Go through the source, find all the passages. If it's the Quran, we, we already have the method. We already have the method right now. Since the Quran says in Surah 3, verse 7, that there are some verses that are unclear, well, great. Now you can use that as a Muslim to go through the Quran and say, well, all the verses that I like, well, those are the clear verses. That's where Allah meant what he said. And all the verses that I that I don't like, the verses that are bad, those are the unclear verses. Those are the verses where we have to interpret it through the lens of these. And then that's what you have to do with the Quran, because you obviously don't want to reject parts of the Quran. But with other sources like the Hadith and so on, there it's simpler. Just every Hadith that you go through, if you agree with it, you say, you see, this supports my view of what the Quran says and what Islam teaches and what Sharia is. And if I don't agree with it, well, it's obviously not an authentic hadith because 
an authentic hadith has to agree with the Quran. And when I say it has to agree with the Quran, I mean, I mean it has to agree with my interpretation of the Quran. But how do I interpret the Quran? Well, everything I agree with, that's good. Allah is clear there. And everything I disagree with, that's unclear. We have to do some serious interpretation. Uh, but but this would just go but this would just go back to my point. If this is if this is the method that we have to use to get to a version of Sharia that's actually good for the world, it's still bad for the world because something that depends on that methodology for figuring out what what the rules are for how we're to interact with the world would be bad. It would be bad if you give rules a lead. understood for 14 centuries that very very few people have actually have actually grasped that so so that's my position there uh uh i, I saw people mentioning the deer so i scrolled through and i saw nadir ahmed say what a fraud david wood is he is running away from the quran and science debate i thought i had already agreed to that debate and that nadir had actually backed out for some reason maybe i'm mistaken here but let me say here in public uh james i agree to that debate I agree to debate Nadir Ahmed on whether science confirms that the Quran is the word of God. So feel free to set that up with Nadir. I'm, I'm, I'm in. All right. Back to you. Back to you, Muji. All right. Uh, yeah. Chapter 76, verse 8. Um, they give food him to the needy, the orphans and the war prisoners, saying, we feed you only for the sake of Allah. We do not get any reward from your, uh, you nor any chance. You meet those who, uh, the, the kofar, yeah, in battle, strike their necks until when you have inflicted, slaughtered up in them, then secure their bonds. It, this is about prisoners, yeah, the, those you captive, and either confer favor ransom them until the war lays down uh, its burdens. So Quran doesn't say anything about that they have to convert and then, uh, or you have to kill them or anything. Chapter 8, verse 70. O Prophet, say to the captives in this in your heart, he will give you that which is better than what has been taken away from you and he will forgive you allah is ever forgiving most merciful and uh, uh, so these those uh, uh, what is it um, uh, 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 stories that i said about um, uh, abu sufyan and uh, you know other um, prisoners of war then they match with quran and i said about hadith that if contradict quran when quran says that uh, uh, you know, about uh, adulterers, you have to slash them 100 lashes and then you have to stand against Quranic teachings. So let's uh, uh, talk about, uh, you talk about uh, killing apostates as well. Uh, yeah. uh, um, repent as well. Okay, repent as well. It's uh, You were talking about that um, there are many uh, verses of Quran that Allah forgives all, uh, you know, sins and the side when their time is off. It's not me that uh, if you kill somebody, I just take you and execute. The only right I have, uh, according Ali Radiallah, is that I rehabilitate you. I, ha I have to keep you somewhere. What was the problem? The governor's job is this, not to punish people. Only God's job is to judge people and punish people. Uh, killing apostates, of, of course, uh, we have a lot of verses of Quran that says um, uh, no compulsion in religion and about those who believe and disbelieve and then believe and again and disbelieve. Allah never says to kill them because if you if the punishment was killing uh, uh, someone who believed and left Islam, then they couldn't believe again okay after have been already killed of course i have uh, you know scholars who um, read such a things and gives uh, verses of quran which i don't know what was the problem that i couldn't play uh, you were not hearing that and uh, uh, sex slave uh, quran says that you have to marry them there is no any sex slave and it's uh, exactly like married let 
if you talk, I can find the the, the verse about. Um, uh, oh, I'll, I'll talk. So, so the so the issue, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the Quran on the issue of. Uh, taking sex slaves is that the Quran, and of course, uh, much more common in the Hadith, would say that Muslim men are supposed to guard their their private parts, so their uh, except except for their wives and those whom their right hands possess. And Surah 33, verse 50, even applies this to Muhammad, that uh, the people that Muhammad is allowed to have sex with are his wives and those whom his right hands possess and so right hand those whom your right hands possess has historically been interpreted as the people you've captured in battle that's what we see over and over again uh, in the hadith and in the sirah and in the commentaries so there are these two categories of people that you're able to have sex with your wives and those whom your right hands possess your your battle captives your your slave girls and so on so that's the way it looks and that's how it's been for uh 14 centuries of islam that's how it was according to the hadith so i mentioned that muhammad himself had been got caught having which there, there was there was no disputing among muhammad's wives that he was allowed to have sex with his slave girls it was considered very very bad to do it in the bed of one of your wives so muhammad's wives had different houses and so on if this is your house you don't bring your slave girl into your wife's bed and then have sex with your slave girl in your wife's bed so one day uh according to the hadith muhammad got caught having sex with his slave girl mary the copt um in the bed of his wife hafsa and she was out running some errands she came home a little early caught him in bed in her bed with his slave girl uh, muhammad said whatever you do don't tell aisha because he didn't want uh, aisha to complain and so Hafsa immediately told Aisha, then all Muhammad's wives were upset. And so finally he swore an oath. I will, I will stop having sex with my slave girl. Just, just stop bothering me. Stop yelling at me. I'll stop. I, I won't do it anymore. And he swears by Allah that he won't do it anymore. But then Allah reveals in the opening verses of Surah 66, Surah 66, it's okay for Muhammad to break his oath to his wife so he could go back to having sex with his slave girl, Mary the Copt. And we know he did because he eventually got her pregnant and apparently married her once he realized that he got her pregnant. So that's what we read in the Muslim sources, right? And I'm sure Muji, I'm sure Muji's gonna have all sorts of problems with this, with this story. But what we read in the Muslim sources, even in a Sahih narration, and even in commentaries, uh, you can read this in uh, Tafsir Jalalain on the uh, passage, Surah 66, verses 1 to 2, that this is referring to Muhammad getting caught, having sex with his slave girl, Mary the Copt, in the bed of his wife, Hafsa, getting in trouble for it, swearing an oath, I'm never going to do it again, and then Allah coming in and saying, actually, you can break that oath because I didn't order you to make that oath, so you're free to break your oath to your wives. And then Muhammad obviously continued and had sex with uh, his slave girl, Mary the Cop. So th notice that th th those are kind of two issues there. One, there's Muhammad doing it. There's Muhammad doing it. But then there are the passages in the Quran which talk about guarding your chastity except with your wives and those whom your right hands possess. And so just to anticipate, I imagine Muji is going to give us some verse it would cause us to reinterpret that so that there aren't, you're not allowed to have sex with those whom your right hands possess until you marry them and to where all the hadith that refer to Muslims uh, taking captives, having sex with their captives. And some of it would be, um, some of it would be, matter of fact, this is just in too many Muslim sources to really just dismiss, but the Muslims would go into a battle, they would take, they would take captives and they would start practicing uh, azal, which is uh, coitus interruptus, which is pulling out before you uh, do do something that might actually get um, get the slave girl pregnant. And they were doing that because they wanted to sell the girls once they got to the next town. So they're capturing these girls, having sex with them, and making sure that they don't get them pregnant. So they pull out before they uh, ejaculate in the girls. They pull out so that when they go to the next town, they can sell them or trade them for more weapons and so on. But things like this uh, after various battles. In fact, um, in Sunan Abu Daud, we even read about the historical background of Surah 4, verse 24 
of the Quran, which says that women are uh, women who are married. You're not allowed to have sex with a woman who's married unless you've captured them, unless you've captured them in battle. And the historical background is given in Sunan Abu Dawud, where Muslims uh, conquered a group of people, but this time, as opposed to earlier times when they had killed the men and the women were left over, and then they could take the women as their sex slaves. In this case, they captured the men and the women, and so Muhammad's followers actually came to him and they raised the issue, hey, wait a minute, are we allowed to have sex with these these women? Because they're already married and their husbands are still alive, so what's going on here? And Allah yes, married women are forbidden for you, except them guess what now you can go ahead and have sex with these married women and it's not counted as adultery because uh allah opened that door for you and and he made it halal to have these uh married women as your sex slaves so that's what we read in the muslim sources and that's that's the understanding we've gotten from the muslim sources and uh looks like muji uh has a different understanding of all of this pardon my interruption uh, did, what was the exception that you said it's I'm so sorry about the, the connection today, you guys. What was the exception you said in particular, David, when Allah would permit it according to your side? When he would permit what? When he would permit the uh, relations. Um, in, in the... Well, it, so there, there were two issues there. One, in the, in the Quran... Allah says over and over again that Muslims are supposed to guard their chastity or that Muhammad is, uh, is supposed to guard his, his chastity and whatever. Uh, but but the two, there are two categories to have sex with. One is their wives, and two are those whom their right hands possess. And so those whom their right hands possess are your battle captives in, in traditional Islam, as it's been understood. So you're allowed to have sex with not only your wives, but your, your, your captives and slave girls. Well, if, you're, if these are two different categories and not the same thing, then it sounds like they're not they're not your wives. And Muji's saying, no, they're your wives. Okay. So that's one issue. And the other issue is um, that n normally we would say it's adultery. It's, adultery is condemned in Islam. And so Muhammad and his followers captured both men and women. And so in previous battles, it was understood, hey, we can take the we can take the women as as our sex slaves, those whom our right hands possess, because their husbands have been their husbands have been killed. This time they catch all the men and women together. And so wait a minute, these women are married. What do we do here? What do we do with these married women? Isn't it adultery? So they actually go to Muhammad. They stop. It says they didn't want to have sex with the women because they're worried that they'd be committing adultery. So they go to Muhammad for the answer. Surah four, verse twenty four of the Quran is revealed, which say, Yes, it is forbidden to have sex with a married woman unless you've unless she's your captive and unless unless you she's one of the people that your right hands possess and this was taken to grant permission to Muhammad's followers to go ahead and have sex with those married women with the married women uh because they they're they're battle captives and so the point the only point here is that's how it's been understood by Muslims Muji I'm, I'm sure has a different interpretation but the point is over and over again it's Muji and maybe a few others who are going against the traditional understanding. It looks like we agree that that traditional understanding would be horrible, um, but I, I just don't under, I don't see how you get around how you keep getting around the way Islam has been understood for for 14 centuries. Thanks for clarifying that, and we'll give you plenty of time to respond, Muji. As I mentioned, sometimes we just had the the connection for some reason has dropped, but go ahead, Muji, and I'll let you know the same Muji in case it drops, in case we need any clarification from you. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I was trying to find the, the verse which uh, says uh, over and over that you have to marry them, <clears throat> okay? And uh, uh, you cannot just, you know, uh, take a, a woman and have sex with them. So uh, I cannot find it right now. But uh, uh, slavery actually uh, uh, was a norm in the past. And uh, as I read for you verses that Allah says, many verses that I read you that uh, righteousness is to free slaves, yeah, that uh, he wanted that people free slaves. And uh, it, slavery is uh, a crime in uh, <clears throat> in Islam because one of the biggest crimes of uh, in Quran, uh, a crime of Frau was to uh, enslave people. Uh, if I, what you want, I can find uh, for you, uh, slave. Um, I've... 
And a reminder, folks, our guests are linked in the description, both here on YouTube as well as at the podcast. So if you're listening via podcast, you can look down in the description box below. You can find both of our guest links there as well. And with that, thanks so much. Perfect. Dawa, I'll kick it right back to you. Yeah, uh, I unfortunately I cannot. But anyway, uh, uh, it's mentioned uh, uh, that uh, his crime was <clears throat> to taking, um, you know, Bani Israel or Israelis uh, uh, in a slave. So one of his biggest crime was enslaving people. So slavery in Islam is itself <clears throat> a crime, but uh, that it was not possible for the time to to abolish it uh, entirely, and uh, uh, it's like, <clears throat> sorry, um, it's like uh, I can give you this example that in Sweden, uh, 1949, uh, the, they realized that this alcohol uh, is uh, very bad for the society, so they tried to stop it by uh, a referendum, and uh, because 51 percent of people voted against uh, banning it, so the government couldn't stop it because it was in their culture. So what government did uh, was put it in liquor store and the liquor store was uh, closed, uh, open only nine in the morning until six in the afternoon and uh, you couldn't drink in the public and so on. So uh, in such a situation when people do not accept it, then the one who want to impose, it's not just to, uh, because especially that in Quran, <clears throat> Uh, it is um, you cannot force people to to believe in Islam. Uh, there is no compulsion in religion. So that's why Allah came with different methods, uh, slowly, slowly to free slaves. And uh, uh, it said it in many, many verses as well that um, slavery was one of the crimes of the uh, Pharaoh. And uh, if you want, we can talk about. Um, by the way, uh, <clears throat> I I would like to say. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, once again, uh, um, David, I was telling you last time that uh, 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 loving uh, people uh, that Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, you know, orders you uh, is not to, um, you know, uh, tearing uh, people's uh, book or chewing people's book or demonizing people always in your videos. Uh, it's uh, not correct that I say to my uh, Christian neighbors that I love you and then I uh, chew their Bible. And uh, I hope that you try from now on work uh, towards peace. Uh, uh, and um, uh, of course, if you are against such a, uh, you know, uh, hadiths, I'm also against them. This uh, wrong interpretation of Quran, I'm also against it. But uh, I urge you that you follow the command of Jesus, peace be upon him, and love your neighbors as yourself, love uh, one another. Unfortunately, I made a great mistake and uh, learned to talk to this um, uh, um, Christian prince. And I don't know from uh, which religion these people follow. He's, I think, one of your friends. Uh, half an hour almost, I was talking to, to him. 20 times he called me stupid, donkey. Abdul, please, um, I also say to my fellow Muslims, don't so much talk about Jesus was crucified or he wasn't crucified, he was prophet of God or he wasn't. If tomorrow entire Christianity believed that Jesus was a prophet of God, nothing will change. So please first learn your own religion, okay? That's why they, they block me. They don't want me to talk to them and tell them that your understanding of Quran is wrong, okay? So before you, uh, you know, you try to demonize Islam and entire uh, Muslim, then try to teach your own fellow Christians like these Christian prince to talk to people a little bit with better manner. He was criticizing you and saying that, oh, David Wood is a nice person and he cannot talk to, you know, talk to debate Muslims. So he thinks that debating Muslim is to tell them all the time, stupid, Abdul, donkey, you know. So um, I, I, I hope that he, uh, from now on <clears throat> you, uh, because I, I read, uh, I, I have a clip from uh, Muhammad Hijab as well, okay, that he was showing, I don't know if you saw it or not, he showed uh, this Norwegian guy who burned Quran and he said, thank you, you help us, you know, you help help us raising 80,000 uh, euros. I don't know, you saw that or not. If I could play it, I have, I have uh, you know, so these things, I think um, 
uh, in, empower these, uh, you know, uh, uh, extremists, you know, helping them because people feel threatened, they feel embarrassed or uh, oppressed. That, that's why they go towards these, uh, you know, extremists and try to help them to, to support them. Uh, I don't know why this Muhammad Hijab was thanking somebody who is burning Quran. He was saying, thank you very much. You help us, you know. So um, I hope that you work towards peace uh, more because uh, I don't think that uh, anyone win from this, uh, you know, only the extremists, of course, they win from um, making people, putting people against each other. So I yeah. don't go to my neighbors and say, I love you, my Christian neighbors, and this is your, your book. I'm going to chew it, okay? No, let me let me yeah. let me go ahead and address that, which I, I think I've done uh, repeatedly before. This is not a situation of me saying, hey, I love you. So let me eat your book. This was that was a specific situation where Muhammad Hijab announced to his followers that the new plan was to threaten the wives of any critics of Islam with these threats of rape and torture. And he announces to his followers that that's what he's doing. And they were specifically going after the apostate prophet's wife. And then, uh, in addition to that, he was announcing to, he, guy has hundreds of thousands of followers, and he was telling his hundreds of thousands of followers, uh, this is what you all need to do as well. We're all going after, I've started it, now you guys go ahead and finish it. So what he's calling for is a campaign of <clears throat> threats and abuse against, against, our, against our wives, against, against, uh, against women. Now, I have always known that there is Surah 6, verse 108 of the Quran, which is telling Muslims not to insult people's religions and so on, uh, if it's going to lead to insults towards Islam. You look at the historical background, the historical background was saying, even if it's going to lead people to insult Muhammad, then don't, don't start tossing around uh, these kinds of insults and attacks and so on. So I looked at that and I said, okay, here's something in the Quran which says, if this is going to cause a backlash against us, then stop it. If it's going to lead to a backlash against, uh, against Islam, then stop it. So I've been aware that I have that in my back pocket for years. So when Hijab is deciding that he's going to escalate and take things to another level by going after people's wives, I said, all right, here's a place where I'm going to implement this. And guess what, Hijab, if you're going to do that and your followers and your hundreds of thousands of followers are now going to go around on social media targeting people's wives, going after people's wives, well, I'm going to eat your book and took a bite out of Surat al-Fatiha. Now, here's the thing, Muji, because I'm responding to what you're saying here. Uh, you're saying we're supposed to love people and loving people uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't involve that. I think it's just the exact opposite. I think if I know a situation where I can prevent some horrible abuse of <clears throat> women and keep men from doing it, I think I'm actually obligated to do something. It doesn't mean I have to do it exactly in exactly that way. That was just what popped into my head. First thing that popped in my head right when it was right when it was happening. But my view is that if you can stop some horrible behavior and stop some of some horrible abuse of, of women targeting of women with online harassment of rape and torture, I think you, you have to do that. So here's the thing. If you let me replay that situation over and over, you if you put me, and by the way, he did stop. They did stop. They stopped it right there. It was, oh, he's going to eat the Quran. Let's stop this horrible, horrible behavior. So it did, it, it, in, in my defense, it did work. But here's the thing. If you give me that same decision to make over and over again and say, okay, these guys, these people with this thug mentality are going to go on a campaign of harassing people's wives unless you do something to stop them. 100 times out of 100 times, if you give me 100 opportunities, what are you going to do in this situation? 100 times out of 100 times, I'm going to do something to make them stop. And if that's eating the Quran or <clears throat> making uh, origami out of the Quran, I'm going to do that 100 times out of 100 times. The different perspective is, I don't say, oh, but that's offensive to them. Of course it's offensive to them. You have to deal with people uh, sometimes who mm -hmm. the only way to make them stop some horrible behavior is to do something that they're going to find uh, offensive. So... Uh, I I would do that every time. I don't regard that as unloving. I think that's like something very loving to do. Hey, I'm standing up for women and I'm making you guys stop before you do some really bad stuff. I'm making you guys stop. In other words, in other words, it's ordinarily bad to shoot somebody. But if someone's about to blow up a busload of children and you shoot that person to make them stop, well, there it's not, oh, you're unloving. You shot someone. No, no that's, you, that's not that. That's the yeah. different, diff definitely different. Different yeah. situation. Yeah. With all, with all, with all of that said, we're kind of off topic, complaining about uh, complaining about yeah. different people and so on. Um, yes. The at the end of the day, on the issues that we're we're talking about, 
um, Sharia. I'm still I'm still stuck on. I, even if I agreed with I don't agree with everything you're saying, but even if I agreed with everything you're saying, I said, you are correct in every interpretation and every Hadith you say is fabricated, you're correct. Even if I were to grant every interpretation of every Quran verse you've given and grant every uh, Hadith fabrication that you've said is fabricated, even if I grant everything you've said, we're still su stuck with the method of interpreting the Muslim sources would be so such a mess it would be such a sloppy process that the vast majority of muslims who who study these issues have gotten it wrong for the vast majority of islamic history and if that's the case then even if it were something good if it's that unclear to where people are reading it and it, it's not actually saying chop their hands off it's saying something else but everyone's interpreting it as chop their hands off and this leads to amputations for 14 centuries because there are still places there's still places like africa and so on where they do these amputations because of what they think the quran means so if the quran is is that hopelessly unclear then uh it just shouldn't be the basis for shouldn't be the basis for uh for how we live today all right uh uh that's uh I said from the beginning that uh, life is a test and uh, Allah, uh, God didn't make everything so easily uh, because some atheists ask uh, why God didn't uh, create us perfect, why God, uh, for example, why God allows uh, uh, hyenas eat uh, uh, their prey so terribly, you know, in such a terrible way, okay? So they they bring up, uh, everybody can bring up their own, uh, you know, wishes that I wish that it was like this. Uh, but chapter 23, verse 96 said, Oh Muhammad, repel evil in the best manner. We are well aware of all that they say about you. And I read many other verses of Quran that in reality, chapter five, verse 38 says that, stop them, the thieves, okay? And if they repent, Allah will forgive them. Okay, and even uh, stealing, even stealing is not only one place. Allah says in another verse that hearing, uh, stealing information is also, uh, you know, uh, stealing. Let me uh, find it for you to read. So stealing is not just to take uh, something physically. Okay, chapter. Uh, 12 verse 79 so woe to those who write sorry not that is not uh okay chapter 15 verse 18 except one who steals a hearing and is uh pursued by a clear clear bearing a burning flame sorry burning flame so ch here even stealing uh, information is stealing so why they don't chop their ear here okay so if stealing something with your hand uh, leads to stealing, uh, to chop, your hands be, being chopped off, then there you have to chop someone's ear because he stole some information. And stealing $1, Quran doesn't talk about stealing $1 or $1, $1 billion. So these are going against, uh, because chapter 3, verse 7 say, said that uh, clear verses of Quran, precise verses of Quran are the foundation of Quran. When Allah is the most merciful, most forgiving, Allah is just. So we understand that this is not just to chop someone's hands for stealing one dollar, and then someone who stole a billion dollars also hands be, be chopped off. So these people they have never been thinking, uh, you know, critically, and they just they didn't care. They just said, okay, chop their hands off. Okay, and I have seen. Uh, such a people, I know such a people who don't care about anybody. They just, uh, you know, they just do such a terrible uh, things like uh, scholars, as I said, like those scholars in, in Iran, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, these Taliban they, themselves, they are uh, a bunch of, uh, by the way, one of the one ISIS, uh, ISIS judges, I remember he was on the run because he was corrupted himself. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the ISIS judges. So these people are themselves a bunch of, uh, you know, corrupted people, bad people, and they want to judge other people. And Allah says only judgment is upon him, not us. Yes. 
We've got four minutes for our concluding statements. Before we go into the Q&A, I want to remind you folks, if you happen to have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat. And if you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, or if you put it in the form of a super chat, we put those at the top of the list. We'll read through them. And I want to let you know, folks, we really do. We want to have as much balance as possible. We need questions for David Wood. We have a lot of questions for Perfect Dawa. And we really do. We want, and this is a criticism we sometimes get, from some not all, but a small percentage of Muslims on Twitter will say, hey, like modern day debate is biased. And it's like, really, if we don't have any questions for the person that, oh gosh, sorry about that. That's embarrassing. No problem. Is if we don't have any questions for our guest who's going against the Muslim speaker, I really don't know what to do. And so if you're a Muslim, if you can share this debate with Muslim friends, we'll have more Muslims here asking questions of David Wood or whoever it is that's facing the Muslim guest. And then we have more balances because we aren't, we're aren't we not purposely trying to stack the odds against anyone. But we're going to jump into those four-minute concluding statements. And given that we had Muji start, we'll have Muji go first with his four-minute concluding statement. Thanks, Muji. The floor is, I mean, perfect dawah. The floor is all yours. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I just uh, would like to say that uh, I wish that we all, uh, you know, as I said, that uh, those verses I read, uh, if you just follow those verses, uh, that you understand and are, they are clear, they teach you to love people, give charity, and so on. If you follow those, uh, uh, you know, verses of Quran, I don't see, um, I don't think any rational person should uh, reject them. And uh, I hope that uh, we all work towards uh, peace, help each other. And uh, <clears throat> yes, if you would like to fight these extremists, then you have to uh, help uh, progressive Muslims uh, because you cannot, uh, David, and uh, people like you cannot fight these extremists except uh, we um, uh, progressive Muslims and uh, uh, that's why, unfortunately, <clears throat> uh, they 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 are banned me. And uh, I think um, uh, James uh, is trying to arrange a debate uh, with um, uh, Daniel Hayraju, and I hope that you manage so that I can uh, directly talk to to them, to such a people, and show that uh, unfortunately they have uh, misinterpreted Quran. So please. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, join me after this. I go live and uh, talk to me, ask your questions directly, and please su subscribe to my channel so that my voice is also heard. Not only these uh, extremist uh, Muslims' uh, voices heard. Okay, so please, uh, uh, David, try to uh, work towards peace because um, you know I, I know that some people make uh, uh, good, uh, you know money from uh, dividing people and uh, for creating hate. Uh, I hope that you are not uh, one of them. Uh, some people, uh, they create fight, war to sell their weapons and so on. So I hope that you are not uh, such a person and try to work towards peace and love people, okay? You got it. Thank you very much for that conclusion. And as mentioned, folks, want to encourage you, if you have questions for David Wood, fire them into the old live chat. And please do share this with your Muslim friends as we are looking to have a balanced community. And thanks, David. The floor is all yours for your four-minute concluding statement as well. All right. Well, uh, yes, uh, I agree, Muji, that we should be working towards peace and love and so on. But I have the issue of... Um, massive numbers of people following the teachings of Muhammad, which as they've been historically understood, are very, very bad and detrimental to world peace. And so as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, uh, I have to oppose those commands and oppose him as a prophet. And it looks like we're partly on the same page. We agree that we do need to deal with this uh, with this, these calls for violence and this extremism and so on. Uh, the, the only difference is I believe that that's what Islam actually teaches. You believe that it's a misunderstanding of Islam. Now, I have to say, um, on this issue of uh, reinterpreting Islam and so on, uh, to Muji's credit, he actually 
takes on Muslims on these issues. So one of the things one of one of the things that historically is always going through our heads when you have groups like, you know, the Council on American Islamic Relations and so on and they're they're here telling us how peaceful Islam is and Islam's actually peaceful and wonderful. One of the things we always are gra- grappling with is, hey, why aren't you telling the people in Afghanistan? Why aren't you telling the people in Pakistan, why aren't you why aren't you first trying to convince your fellow Muslims that it's peaceful and that they shouldn't be calling for jihad against the world? Why aren't you going why aren't you going after them? Why are you telling us? Don't tell us, go tell them. Get it through to them so that so that we don't have to deal with uh, with uh, this endless violence. Uh, so that's normally a criticism that we're thinking. But uh, to, again, to Muji's credit, he does actually try to convince his fellow Muslims, and uh, he, he does try to to convince uh, popular Muslims that he is correct. So, uh, but there is this problem of ongoing problem of reinterpretation, reinterpreting the historical Muslim texts uh, that. If you want to reinterpret the texts and the Quran sounds like it's saying something and the Hadith sound like they're confirming this and you want to come up with a different interpretation, I mean, in is, historically in Islam, that's considered the sin of innovation. So most Muslims would look at someone who's calling into question the penalty for amputation or the killing of apostates and so on. Most Muslims who actually know what they're talking about on these issues would say, you're actually sinning by reinterpreting these things. You're, you're committing the sin of innovation. So if we're talking about, um, you know, Muhammad having sex with a, a nine-year-old girl or the taking of sex slaves or beating women into submission, chopping off hands, stoning for adultery, killing apostates and imposing uh, jizya by violently subjugating Jews and Christians, and you say, no, that's that's not what Islam teaches on those issues. It actually teaches something very different. Uh, you're going to be accused as an innovator in Islam. And that's why, that's why I say that either way, either way, Islam is dangerous. On the issue of, uh, Muji brought up the issue of uh, uh, the Quran verse, um, no compulsion in religion. Well, you've got various Muslim commentators who say that's a verse that's been abrogated or that it means something different. It was applying to a a specific context. Uh, If you go back to the early Muslim commentators, no one agrees that it means what Muslims say it means today. No one thinks, no one thought that it meant that. That there's just, oh, you you never impose this on anybody. No one thought that it meant that. It was either abrogated or it meant something else. Why? Because they knew that later commands like fight those who do not believe uh, still applied, and therefore they have to they have to understand that verse in a certain way. And so, um, if you want to reinterpret it and go against the grain of history, you're free to do that. But you're still left with this either or situation. Either the Muslim sources mean what they what they say, in which case it's definitely bad for humanity. Sharia is bad for humanity, or Sharia is so hopelessly unclear because the Muslim sources are such a mess that you can never figure out what it says and the vast majority of people conclude that it means something very different from what Allah really means in which case it's bad for humanity so either it's bad for humanity or it's bad for humanity